Before Ladies us. and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Chimamanda Ngozi oh. Adichie. Yeah. Welcome, man. Thank you. Igwe Okija, Eke Nemgi. Ndi fani Igwe Di Achi, Ndi Chief, Nandi Ichi, Eke Nekwa Munu. Ndi Okija Nine, Mandi Neba, Mandi Nano Reba. Igwe Madi Nine, Biale Mumea. Konye Chili, Naz Nyazelu. I want to be able to get the Jackson Foundation. I want to be able to get the name of the Jackson Foundation. I want to be able to get the name of the Jackson Foundation. I want to be able to get the name of the Jackson Foundation. Good evening. I'm very happy to be here. My father is from Aba in Njikoka, local government area. My mother is from Umunachi in Dunukofia, local government area, both in Anambra State. And I grew up in Nsuka in Enugu State. And all of those towns are very important in my sense of identity. And so I am thrilled to be here speaking in Igbo land. And I am proud to be a product of Igbo land. Igbo land produced that great political and cultural colossus, Namdi Azikiwe. Igbo land produced that mathematics genius, Professor James Ezilo. Igbo land produced Nkem Dora Akunyili. May her soul continue to rest in peace. Igbo land produced Nigeria's first professor of statistics, a man I also happen to call daddy, Professor James Adichie. Igbo Land produced the first woman to be the registrar at the University of Nigeria and Sukkah, a woman I also happen to call mommy. <laughs> Igbo Land produced great writers. If Chino Achebe and Flora Wapa and Buchi Emecheta and Chukwe Emekike had not written the books they did, when they did, how they did, I would not have had the emotional courage to write my own books. And so today I honor them and I stand respectfully in their shadow. I also stand with great pride in the shadow of so many other daughters and sons of Igbo land. We have much to be proud of in Igbo land. We have many from whom we can take inspiration. So I want to start today with a message for all the young people here. Consider yourself a lifelong student. Never stop learning. I have a postgraduate degree, but I consider myself a student, a person who will always be eager to learn. I want to ask you to get as much formal education as you can. And I want to say to you, stay in school. Even if you want to start a business, you will be a better businesswoman or a businessman if you are literate, if you can think critically. And these are all things one gets from an education. And I say this particularly because those are the many of us in Igbo land who seem to think that what matters is business. But education is not just what somebody teaches you in school. Education is also about the effort that you make. Reading is essential. And I don't mean reading for school exams. I mean reading outside of what you're asked to read in school. When I was growing up, I read everything I could find. And of course, I grew up at a time when the internet was not the ubiquitous presence that it is now. I know that the internet is here to stay. And I think the internet can be a good or a bad thing, depending on how you use it. 
So you can use the internet to waste your time. You can read stupid gossip online, and you can get into meaningless arguments on Facebook. Or you can use your data to educate yourself. You can read quality newspapers online. You can watch videos that teach you something. The internet is full of free classes that you can access easily. Learn. Think of each new day as an opportunity to learn something new. One of my interests is pre-colonial Africa. I'm very curious about who and what we were before colonialism came. Now, most of the recorded history about Igbo people and about many other ethnic groups in Africa came from foreigners, men and women who did not speak the language and did not understand the nuances of the culture, which means that we have to read everything they write with a certain level of skepticism. But what is consistent about all of the, the books I have read about pre-colonial Igbo land is that Igbo people valued integrity. Igbo people were known to be frank, known to be people who did not pretend, known to be people who valued open communication between the old and the young, between parents and their children, and known to be people who believed in individual achievement, but also felt that consensus was the best way to govern a community. Now, in thinking of communication as an Igbo value, I thought about a young woman I know in Lagos. She's 25 years old, she's from Anambra State, and she said to me that she did not want to come back to her hometown for Christmas. And when I asked her why, she said she's under so much pressure from her parents to get married. And she said, they don't just want me to marry, they want me to marry a rich man. And at the same time, as recently as two years ago, she said, if she so much as brought up a man's name, her parents would shout at her because she wasn't supposed to have a boyfriend. And so, of course, one wonders how she's supposed to meet the man who's supposed to become the husband today. But most of all, what touched me in talking to her was when she said, I cannot talk to my parents. And so, I want to ask the parents here today, particularly the parents of teenagers, please keep communication open between you and your children. Many parents today teach their children to fear them, but not to respect them. Fear is not respect. You can beat fear into a child, but respect is something that a parent earns. Don't shut your children up. Listen to them. Give them advice without shouting. Actually, if you don't shout, they're likely to hear you better. And as you give the advice, remember the follies of your own youth. Nobody's perfect. I want to suggest today that we all take on the name Ekweme. Let us not only talk, let us all act. Let us do as we say. Some years ago, I ran into a woman in Enugu, a woman who's an old family friend. She was with her little son. I said Kedu to the boy, and the woman said very quickly, no, 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 he doesn't speak Igbo. He speaks only English. What struck me was not just that this child did not speak Igbo, but that, that his mother said this with so much pr pride. She was proud that her child did not speak Igbo. Why, I asked her. Her reply was, speaking Igbo will confuse him. I want him to learn to speak English well. So later, as we talked about her son's school, she mentioned that he was taking piano lessons and French lessons. And so I asked her, if learning Igbo will confuse him, wouldn't learning French also confuse him? The woman's reason that two languages would confuse her child sounds reasonable on the surface, but is it true? It is simply not true. We know that children have the ability to learn different languages. And in fact, we know that being bilingual or multilingual benefits children in areas outside of languages. But I don't really need to read studies about this. I am the proof. I grew up speaking Igbo and English at the same time. I consider both of them my first languages. 
And I can assure you that in my 41 years on earth, I am yet to be confused by that. I'm actually hoping, <clears throat> I'm actually hoping to improve my French and learn Swahili and Hausa, so maybe then I will be confused. My sister, my parents' first child, was born in the US when my father was a doctoral student. My parents made the decision to speak only Igbo to her because they knew she would learn English. They were determined that she would speak Igbo, and they did. And I can assure you that my sister is also not confused. When my daughter was born three years ago, my husband and I decided that I would speak only Igbo to her. She now speaks Igbo. And people are always shocked, particularly Igbo people, when they hear my daughter speak. I deeply love both English and Igbo. English for me is the language of literature, the language of philosophy. But Igbo is the language of emotion, the language of humor, the language of laughter and family. This is Igbo. Igbo is the enduring link to my past. Igbo is the language in which my great-grandmothers sang. Sometimes when I listen to old people speaking in my hometown, Abba, I find myself wishing that my own Igbo were not so anglicized. I am full of admiration for the complexity of their language, for the proverbs that they use, and I am in awe of the culture that produced this poetry. Because that is what Igbo language is when it is spoken well, it is poetry. And so, and so to deprive our children of the gift of this language at a time in their lives when they can easily absorb it is an unnecessary loss. We now have all over, all over Igbo land grandparents who cannot really talk to their grandchildren because they have a hulking, impermeable barrier between them called language. Even when the grandparents speak English, there is often an awkwardness in the conversation because they do not have the luxury of slipping into Igbo when they need to because they are navigating on familiar spaces. And the loss is made worse by imagining what could have been. Imagining the stories that could have been told the wisdom and the history that might have been passed down to the grandchildren, and most of all, the subtle sense of grounding and the sense of identity that comes from knowing one's language. Recently, my British-born niece, Kamsiyonna, once heard me talking, and somebody said something, and I responded, oh, dear. And she asked me, what does it mean, auntie? And I was not sure how to translate it. How does one translate Odiebu? <laughs> Can anybody help me translate Odiebu? <laughs> there are some things that are difficult to translate. So language is not just about communication. It's really also about worldview. It's about a way of looking at the world. Some people argue that language is the only thing that makes culture, but I disagree. I think identity is much more complex. I think that culture is really a way of looking at the world. And so there are Igbo people who do not speak the language, but that does not necessarily make them any less Igbo. In fact, I think that for the young people today who do not speak Igbo, we cannot hold them responsible. It is their parents that we must hold responsible. And so I would like to go back to the story of the woman in Enugu who was very proud to tell me that her child doesn't speak Igbo. The opposite of her pride is shame. And so she was ashamed of the idea of a child who spoke Igbo. Where is this shame from? Why are we ashamed of who we are? The great Ghanaian writer, Ama Ateidu, asks this question in her novel, Changes. Why have we insisted on speaking about ourselves in the same condescending tone that others have used to speak of us? There, there are other Igbo people and Igbo parents who don't necessarily think that Igbo will confuse their children. They just think that Igbo is not that important. After all, it's a small language spoken only in southeastern Nigeria, and it is not important in a newly globalized world. 
or as one of the parents said to me, Kedebeji Boeje. It is indeed true that the world is increasingly global, but to succeed in this global world does not mean giving up on who we are. It means keeping what we are and adding to it. I remember being very impressed when I went to Iceland by the effort that the people of Iceland put towards preserving their language. Iceland is a tiny country with a population less than that of Igbo land. Many people there speak English, but speaking Icelandic is very important to them. And it is not because Icelandic is an economic power. After all, Iceland is not the next China, and nobody is learning Icelandic in the way that people are learning Mandarin. It is instead because the people of Iceland value their language.